I'm going to begin with a question for us to consider. What will it take for you to be satisfied? There are two answers that some may give that are both found in our passage today. Religion and relationships. We have a Samaritan who were not thought of favourably by the Jews and our reading certainly touches on the theme of religion. Where and how can we worship God? Is is the water of Jacob representing the Old Testament law? Is this the way to God? Or does Jesus offer something altogether new? Or relationships. The woman in our story has had five previous partners, is now on her sixth man. Is, Is sex and relationships where lasting satisfaction can be found? How would you answer the question, what will it take for you to be satisfied? Perhaps finding the the right religion and, and having answers to the philosophical questions of life. Someone told me on Saturday outside the church that he had loads and loads of questions and he was desperately looking for answers. Or do you look for satisfaction and fulfilment in a relationship? If only I had the perfect husband or wife. Perhaps it's in our job, or in being respected by others, in status, or in our home, our comfort, our recreation. What is the if only I had answer that you would give? A new relationship, a new job, more money, more time, more respect, a better lifestyle? I can't get no satisfaction. Can you relate to these lyrics, to the feeling that the more you have, the more you need. There is a longing in our hearts to find fulfilment and satisfaction. The question is, where are we looking? What will it take to quench our thirst for more? What will it take for us to be satisfied? Here are the words of Jesus. We read in our passage today, verse 13, Jesus answered, everyone who drinks the water I give will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Jesus offers a water that if we drink, we need never be thirsty again. This is a complete game changer. But before we get there, let's look at the woman in our story. We don't know her name, but she is a Samaritan. The Samaritans were a religious group based on a version of the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Old Testament, made from a sort of mix of religious influences. But they were bitter rivals, as it were, despised by the Jews. The Samaritan woman um, is amazed that Jesus talks to her. Verse 9, you are a Jew and I'm a Samaritan. How can you ask me for a drink? And then when the disciples return, um, they're surprised to see Jesus talking to a Samaritan and a, a, and a woman, even more surprising, at a time when there was so much male prejudice against women. The time is 12 noon, the heat of the day, a time when most would have been at home resting in the shade. So perhaps a woman comes at that time because she is a social outcast. Morally, she has a checkered past. She's living with a man, not her husband, um, and has had at least five husbands previously. She is a racial, social, moral outcast as far as most Jewish leaders of that day were concerned. But not to Jesus. This is a remarkable thing in the passage, that Jesus would go out of his way to talk to and encourage this lady with such dignity and respect with such love. Jesus is heading through Samaria on his way back north to Galilee. Many Jews would have gone around the area, avoiding the Samaritan territory altogether. But just look at verse 4. It says Jesus had to go through Samaria. He had to go that way. Why? Because he had a woman there he had to meet. The location, the time is not coincidental, but prearranged by the Son of God. We're reminded um, of Jesus' humanity. He was tired out, worn out. He sat by the well, thirsty. But Jesus was there on a mission. There was a woman he needed to speak with, to engage with, 
to rescue. So we're going to look again at the story. We're going to see three things. We're going to think about true water, true worship and true witness. So firstly, then, true water. When the Samaritan woman comes in the heat of the day um, to draw water from the well, Jesus asks her for a drink. She's surprised. Why would Jesus want to talk to an outcast like her? And Jesus challenges her. So look with me at verse 10. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is who asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. So the woman said, You have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us this well? And, and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his flocks and herds. She's blunt to begin with, and she's almost sarcastic. This was a spot of land that Jacob had purchased and had built an altar on, and he was said to have built a, a well there. Is Jesus claiming to have a better source of water than this well, which was good enough for Jacob, that great figure of the Old Testament? We looked at uh, Jacob last year, um, who had... Uh, received the, the, the promise from God. Jacob's water, as it were, stood for Old Testament religion. Rabbis would see the Torah, the Old Testament law, as, as living water. This was what was needed, surely, to uh, live following the rules of God. In Jeremiah um, chapter 2, verse 13, God is the spring of living water that people have uh, turned from to drink from broken cisterns. In, in Isaiah 12, water is linked with salvation. It says, with joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. And in Ezekiel 36, water is promised by God to clean us to cleanse us from impurity and sin. So water in the Bible is linked to how we have a right relationship with God. It's about having our sins forgiven, uh, washed clean. It's about being saved. And as John 7 makes plain, it's about being given the Holy Spirit to live inside us. Where will we drink from? The well of Old Testament religion? or the water Jesus offers. Sometimes we think being a Christian is about rule keeping, about being a better person, or about a religious system somehow. But Jesus challenges this misconception. Being a Christian is about receiving the living water that Jesus alone can offer. Water that satisfies. Verse 13, Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman says to him, sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. You see, the woman's attitude is changing. She wants the water that Jesus offers. Forgiveness rescue from sin and death, the Holy Spirit to lead us into new life. This is the water of Jesus that wells up inside us to give us eternal life in Christ. This is the better water, the only water that will satisfy. So if religion is what you look to for satisfaction, you need to look beyond this. You need to look to Jesus. Because it's not about rules, it's not about an institution or religion, it's about Jesus, it's about receiving his gift of life. But this woman has another lesson to learn. Just as um, the Old Testament law will never bring lasting satisfaction, neither will anything else that we can sometimes inadvertently end up living for. Go call your husband and come back, Jesus says to her. I have no husband, she replies. You are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is you have had five husbands and the man you now have is not your husband. This woman may have had a promiscuous 
lifestyle. She may not have been married to the man she was with. Her, her sexual indiscretions may have been severely frowned upon by those around her. But Jesus calls her to follow. If she was looking for satisfaction in, in sex or relationship of any sort, she would be left disappointed. There would always be that, that constant longing for more. But Jesus could offer her something altogether new and different and better. Living water to drink. Water that will never leave us thirsty again. He offers himself his life, his death, his resurrection, and he invites us to, to, to receive him and become joined to him through faith, the only place of salvation, the only place of true satisfaction. So firstly then, true water, living water that Jesus offers. Secondly, true worship. The woman tries to change the subject. But we move from water to a related topic, worship. Samaritans worshipped gods on a, 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 at a rival temple that had been built and later destroyed on Mount, um, Mount Jebusim. So she asks Jesus, where should we worship, on this mountain or in Jerusalem? Well, neither, Jesus replies, because true worship is not about a place. It's not limited to a fixed place or time. It's not about religious practice. It's not ceremonial, but personal. So look at verse 21. Jesus declared, believe me, woman, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know. For salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For they are the kind of worshippers the Father seeks. God is spirit and his worshippers must worship in spirit and truth. Knowing God as Father, as we can through Jesus Christ, means we can worship through the Spirit, wherever we are. True worship involves Spirit, our Spirit. Worship God with our hearts and truth. It is centred in reality. True worship is not about a place or outward religious ceremony. It's now relational. We worship the Father now, wherever we are in spirit and in truth. That's why, um, in many ways, we don't need to make too much of our building. We are not attached to our church building as such. We can worship God wherever we are. When I come into the church building, I don't come into God's house because God dwells everywhere. I don't need to be in church, in a building to worship. I can worship God with my life as I live for him moment by moment. I don't miss the building so much as I miss the people. Yes, meeting together with other Christians is significant. It's what we are commanded in the Bible to do. But no building is any more sacred than any other building. It's through our hearts, our spirits and our mind that we can worship God wherever we are, through Jesus, by his spirit. Jesus makes this wonderful declaration to the, to the woman here in verse 26. I who speak to you am he. I am the Christ, he's saying, the long-awaited rescuing king. The first person Jesus is ready to reveal his identity to as the Christ. Is this outsider, marginalised, the least likely candidate, and yet loved by Jesus and called by Jesus? True water, true worship, and thirdly, true witness. Jesus' disciples return. They are amazed to find Jesus talking to a Samaritan woman. They urge Jesus to eat, but Jesus' food, he says, is to do the will of my Father who sent me. 
The harvest is ready, Jesus tells them, and the disciples must join Jesus in his work of reaping what others have sown, bringing in the harvest. But the woman in our story, she has been offered uh, by Jesus living water. She's been offered forgiveness and eternal life, and she must turn from whatever idols she is worshipping. She must turn away from the ceremonial and rules-based religion. She must embrace the new worship, knowing a personal God who is her Father through Jesus Christ. She must turn from her sin. Her sin has been exposed, and she is now ready to, to turn from her sin and to embrace the new life that Jesus offers. And so what does she do? Well, look on how the story continues. Verse 28. Then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, Come, see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Christ? They came out of the town and made their way towards him. The woman leaves her water jar. The water from Jacob's well is no longer enough. She leaves it behind. She has found something altogether better. And she immediately goes and gets on with the task of sharing the good news of Jesus. Don't you, don't you find new Christians are, are so often the best, most passionate evangelists? Don't let our love for Jesus grow cold. Don't let that first love you had for him grow dim. People are lost. People need to hear. What incredible um, results this woman has as she shares her story far and wide. So verse 39. Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. Isn't that incredible? The Samaritans urged Jesus to stay with them longer. Verse 41, and because of his words, many more became believers. Wow, what a mission, all from this lady's testimony. Verse 42, they said to the woman, we no longer, we no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves. And we know that this man really is the saviour of the world. Not just the saviour of the Jews, but the saviour of all people, Jew, Gentile, Samaritan. Jesus is all we need. What an incredible encounter. I would like to share just two things that I think Jesus is saying to you from this passage. Think back to the question at the start. What is your if only I had answer? Where were you hoping to find satisfaction and fulfilment? Whatever it is, it will leave you thirsty. If you put all your eggs in the basket of I must be married or I must have a better job or I must have more time for myself, I must get the house sorted, I must move, you'll only be left wanting. Nothing in this life will truly satisfy. But Jesus, the living water, promises to quench our deepest longing and thirst. He is all sufficient. He is enough. The one who came for you to rescue you from sin and to give you new life. Jesus says, follow me, I am enough. Our worship is transformed. Because it's not about a building or about rules. It's about a person. Jesus Christ, the way to the Father. So Jesus is saying to you, I am enough. Only I can truly satisfy. Any other water will leave you thirsty. I am the living water you need today. Will you tell God that he is enough for you? And will you demonstrate that in how you live this week? Jesus is saying to you also, look at my grace to the lady in the story. Look at how her life is transformed so quickly. I can do this for you.
Now go, share the good news. Take every opportunity to share with others how I am the living water who satisfies and who gives life. Go and tell. See what I can do. Will you pray now and ask God to give you boldness as you go like the woman and share your story with others? We're going to finish with a song. And um, I just want to read some of the words to this song that we're about to listen to or sing along to now. Jesus said that if I thirst, I should come to him. No one else can satisfy, I should come to him. Jesus said if I am weak, I should come to him. No one else can be my strength, I should come to him. Jesus said that if I fear, I should come to him. No one else can be my shield. I should come to him. Jesus said, if I am lost, like the woman in the story, he will come to me. And he showed me on the cross, he will come to me. For the Lord is good and faithful. He will keep us day and night. We can always run to Jesus. Jesus strong and kind. Jesus said, that if I thirst, I should come to him. Let's sing this song and let's make this our prayer as we commit to receiving and drinking the living water that Jesus offers us.